Ah, physics. What a marvelous subject. Hello, and welcome today. My name is Reese Boston, and I'll be presenting you with your first lesson on physics. Let's go ahead and begin. All right, so let me just move over here. OK. So as mentioned, my name is Reese Boston, and I will be your instructor for first semester physics, uh, first summer session, uh, Physics 115. This is General Physics 2, intended for students of life sciences. I personally love this class. I ask to teach this class every single semester. The reason why I love this class so much is because it is intended, it's especially targeted for students of the life sciences. And it's not that I personally enjoy life sciences very much at all. The reason why I like this is because you, the students, always enjoy this course. Even though it's challenging at times, we really go out of our way to make sure you always know, you're always able to see the, the biological or otherwise relevant application for what we're talking about. So we, we want this to be relevant to you. I've taught physics at other universities where even though it's intended for biology majors, it's entirely about you know, massless strings and pendulums and, and blocks sliding down ramps. And so students quickly disengage because they don't care and then they get frustrated because it's hard and they don't care. At the, the way we teach physics here, I really enjoy because students are actually engaged and I love seeing that. So I love this course and I hope you love this course as well. A little bit about me. Um, I am a graduate student here at UNC. My thesis dissertation, that's redundant. My dissertation research is on the relativistic effects of white dwarf stars, particularly looking at the pulsations of white dwarf stars and what the pulsations look like when they're orbiting around a black hole. Um, that's a little bit about me. Let's look at today's lecture. We are going to start with a review of course structure. We're then going to move into a, this overview of the topics that we're gonna cover. And I'm gonna show you their biological applications, just a brief you know, couple of slides, what we'll talk about. Then we're gonna do some review of topics we should have discussed in your first semester physics course. So let's look at the course structure. This is a lecture studio online course. So if you don't know what lecture studio means, what that means is we have a one hour lecture and the one hour lecture will give you an introduction to the topics that we're going to be to the introduction to the topic that day, just you know, a brief outline of it. And then we have a studio, which is a follow up to the lecture. And that studio is meant to enhance, to reinforce concepts you learned during the lecture. The studio, if you haven't heard that before, it's similar to a lab, but it's not strictly a lab. You don't strictly perform experiments and collect data. Some parts will have you do uh, homework-like questions or test-like questions, and you'll be working in a group, and you'll also have your professor or your TA there to help answer questions and get you to thinking correctly. So that's how we present classes here. Uh, for each lecture, there is a studio that corresponds to it. So for every lecture, there is an, the following studio that covers those same topics. The lectures will be given asynchronously through videos that we will post online to YouTube. That is, that's how you're watching this right now. We're going to have one lecture video for every single day of class. So every day during uh, this summer session, there is one video that corresponds to that day. You do not have to watch that video that day. If you'd rather watch that video beforehand and then um, just kind of briefly review the material before studio or however you'd like to do this, you can watch the questions on your own time with one important caveat. And the important caveat is that you must watch the video before you come to the corresponding studio. In each lecture, we're going to have a period where we pause and ask you a question. There's several questions embedded in these lectures. The answers to these questions you'll submit to Gradescope, and you must do this before you come to the corresponding studio. So right now, so much of this class has changed from how we normally offer it because so much has changed and so much has to be done. I have teamed up with the other summer instructors, and uh, we have decided that we would sort of split the effort on these lecture videos. So I will not be giving you every lecture. Some of the lectures you see will be coming from Dr. Young or from Dr. Wallace, 
who are uh, two introductory physics instructors here at UNC. They have taught this several times in the past, multiple times. And so they'll, the lectures from them will, I'm sure will be, will be excellent. You will not see me again until lecture seven, where I'll be talking about electric fields and forces. And then I'll continue talking about potentials, potential energy. And after the section on electrostatics, You'll see me again at RC circuits. You'll see me again at thin films. And then for the last two sections, sorry, the last two lectures on nuclear physics. Because we're offering the lectures asynchronously through these online videos, we have decided to take that normal time from, 10, from 9 to 10 a.m. where you would normally be getting the lecture in person. And we're gonna use that as a question and answer session. So every single day from 9 to 10 a.m., I will be available on Zoom you can, if you choose, it's, it's optional, you can, if you choose, come in and ask me a question about your homework, about the studio, any question you have, you can ask during that time. That'll be every single day during the normal lecture time. We then have an online studio. This is approximately a two hour studio offered every single day. This one, you have to attend. The attendance is mandatory and you must attend this over Zoom. That's important, you must attend through Zoom, so you need a strong internet connection. If you do not have a strong internet connection, you could consider joining over your phone. Zoom does allow for this. Then you have to worry about your data charges and your phone plan charges, but you must be attending this. If you're not able to attend two hours a day, every day for four weeks on Zoom, then uh, you might not be able to take this course this semester. All of the written materials for the studio will be available on Sakai. Um, so that'll give you the, the instructions and they'll tell you all of the material you, all the material you need for studio and also give you the questions. The answers to the studios you'll submit through Gradescope. Those are due by 2 p.m. on the day of the studio. And your studio section that'll be taught by Kevin Knox and me. Kevin Knox will be your TA for this course. You'll get to meet him during our first studio. Midterm exams, there'll be four of them. We have a midterm exam every single week. Every single week, it is Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. Um, 8 a.m., I know it sucks. It's a terrible time to take a physics exam. So when you registered for this course, you had to register for what the 8 a.m. recitation session, I think is what they called it. That is what we use normally to give our exams, even during the normal semester. We're going to still be using that. I'll be giving you your exam at 8 a.m. Uh, thankfully, unlike past semesters, because I'm emailing you the test, you do not need to actually wake up at like 6 a.m. to have breakfast and drive to school. You can, if you want to, roll out of bed at 7.50, drink some coffee, and then take your test. So you do get to sleep in a little bit more than you would in a normal semester. But yeah, 8 a.m., that's when I'll be giving you your exam. This exam, it'll be sent out electronically, probably over email. I need you to print this out, handwrite your answers to the exam on your paper, scan your paper, and then submit your paper to Gradescope. This needs to be turned in within 50 minutes of me sending it out. You only have 50 minutes to take this test. If you don't have access to a printer, then that's okay. You don't need to write on the test. If you prefer, you can instead have a blank sheet of paper and write your answer to the question on the sheet of paper. Make sure that you have one answer per sheet of paper if you're going to do it this way. Also notice I said scan and submit to Gradescope. A scan is a scan. It is not a picture you took with your phone. Uh, please do not submit a picture where you can see your hands holding down the paper. I can see what your tablecloth looks like. All that stuff, don't submit one of those. I need you to actually submit me a scan of your exam. Now, you can take a scan with your phone. You can do that. There are a number of applications that will enable you to do this. For instance, with Google Drive, if you have Android, there's a way to, um, to take a scan from this application. There's a few other applications I've listed here. These will take a picture. They'll use the camera function on your phone, but uh, collate the pictures into a a professional looking scan um, that'll actually have things like searchable text and stuff like that. It'll form a PDF. It won't be an image where I can see like your knee on your bed, right? So please make this an actual scan and not a picture. 
if you submit a picture, if you want to try me, I'm not going to grade it. Just warning you. All right, there's always one person who wants to, to try it. The final exam then is going to be Thursday, June 18th. So mark that on your calendars. That'll be our last exam. It'll be given similarly. I will email out the exam at a specific time, and you have to turn it back into grade scope at a specific time. Your textbook for this course is College Physics, A Strategic Approach by Knight, Jones, and Field. I'm not actually sure what edition they're on now. Uh, obviously, the older editions work. Physics hasn't changed since two years ago when they wrote the fourth edition. There is a Mastering Physics e-text available, or you can get the hardcover, whichever you prefer. If you purchased the, um, the textbook, it should come bundled with Mastering Physics, which is the homework system we'll be using. Uh, there will be certain readings from this textbook that will be assigned in, will be assigned in warm-ups. We don't have warm-up activities anymore, but please read the textbook before watching the lecture. That will, will help you solidify the concepts in the lecture, having already kind of seen them in your, in your reading beforehand. There's some topics that there are readings that aren't in the textbook, and those will be posted on Sakai. Next, next thing is uh, Mastering Physics. You need to get this. If you bought the textbook, it should come bundled with it. If you've already taken 114, you do not need to repurchase Mastering Physics. Your old code should work. So if you already took 114, do not repurchase Mastering Physics. I will send out the course ID and instructions on how to register uh, once I have Mastering Physics set up. Another thing you'll need is some kind of computer with a video camera, preferably with a video camera. I understand some, some laptops or computers don't have video cameras and webcams are kind of expensive, especially now. So if, if you don't have a video camera, then that's fine. Um, you need to teleconference into the studio. So in our studio, I know not everyone has a webcam and there's issues with bandwidth, but I would still like to implore you to please join through video. And my reason for asking you this, you know, I, I have a few reasons. One of them is the personal, kind of interpersonal feel you get from having the video on. We're actually able to see people. You can actually read their expressions. You can actually see where their eyes are looking, if they're looking like at their phones while you're talking at them, for instance, if that's kind of important. Another reason, you know, everyone's on lockdown and just having personal interaction is nice. Um, one maybe more important reason is that as an instructor, I can tell from your facial expression if you actually understand what I'm saying or if you're just pretending that you understand what I'm saying. I can actually tell. And that's important for me to know because it's important for me to know if I need to keep explaining something. It's important for you to know if my explanation made sense or if my explanation was a bad one. And I can pick that up from your facial expression. So I'd like it if you could please have your video up if you are able to. If your internet is getting choppy, it, you, it keeps kicking you out, and that's fine. You can turn off your video and that will increase, sorry, that won't increase your bandwidth. That will lower your bandwidth demand. If you've never used Zoom before, there's some information here. Uh, you can load this slide and click on here and that should open it up. This just gives you some, some guidelines on how to use Zoom. One thing I, I would like to point out is that in Zoom, if, for instance, you don't have a beautiful bookshelf behind you and you're, you know, aren't really comfortable showing your house, I completely understand your house is your house. Zoom allows you to change the background. And so instead of being in your house, you could be you know, in San Francisco Bay, and now no one can see my, what's behind me. Uh, if you don't like San Francisco Bay, you could go to, you know, deep orbit around the Earth. I guess it's actually low space orbit around the Earth. Um, you could, this, this one here is one of my favorites, uh, or you, you could be in the Wild West. There, there's all kinds of places, you, could, you know, of course the beach one, this one's a perennial favorite. There's all kinds of things you could put here so that no one can see your actual house. They would just be seeing you, but you would still have the benefit of being able to have, you know, eye contact with people and see you know, how they're doing in studio, if they're really aggravated with you or something like that. So I'm going to put back my beautiful bookshelves. Um, another thing you need is scotch tape. This is a required material. You need at least one roll of scotch tape. Uh, I got mine right here. Make sure you have yours. If you don't have any, find a way to safely have it. Just find, uh, find a way to safely get some scotch tape. 
if you're able to safely go out to the store and buy it, then then do that. But if you need it delivered, then figure out what works best for you. Don't let me tell you how to get scotch tape. <laughs> um, we're going to use this in Studio 7, so make sure you have some. Logger Pro, there are instructions for how to download the software in your syllabus. It is, it's really hard to download Logger Pro. I don't even remember how to do it. I just remember it's extremely circuitous. Go ahead and get this. There are instructions in the syllabus. You cannot get it through the software acquisition website for some reason. Uh, you will need this when you're analyzing the data in our studios. Because we cannot physically meet in person, it means that you can't do some of the experiments you would normally do because you can't do the experiments. We are going to have someone else do the experiment, and then he's going to take pictures of his experiment and send it to you. With the Logger Pro software, you'll be able to analyze those pictures. And so if you want to know a distance, you'll be able to use a scale on the image. And then based on the number of pixels in the image, it will tell you a very accurate measurement of the distance between two points or something. You can also, it'll allow you to scroll frame by frame through a video, which will be very useful when you're trying to measure times on certain of these videos. So Logger Pro will be very helpful for you, especially now using this, these online uh, data we're going to be giving you. Scientific or graphing calculator is probably not as important as it used to be since you could just use Wolfram Alpha. But if you have one, that'll definitely help. Let's talk about your grade in this course. Your attendance is 5% of your total grade, and you get full credit for just answering and participating. When I say attendance, what I mean here is your response to the lecture questions. So just for answering the questions, you will get full credit. Now, we are considering maybe having some kind of test question to make sure that you actually watched the lecture and didn't just answer A to every question. We're considering something like that, but you don't need to answer any of the physics questions correctly to get credit. You just need to have tried. Because you just need to have tried, I'd like to implore you to please actually try. Um, I know that I give you the question and 30 seconds later, I'm going to tell you the answer. And if you don't click pause, you'll just hear the answer. But that doesn't really help you at all because you're not reinforcing it through the struggle. Actually struggling at something reinforces your brain to work better at it. So I, I highly recommend get the most out of the course. Actually, when I say pause the video, pause the video and try to answer the question. All right, homework, that's 10% of your grade. This will be through Mastering Physics. I'm going to have this due the Sunday before each of your exams. The exams are on Tuesday. All of the homework is due on Sunday. And then Monday, that means you have Monday afternoon to study. I would like to uh, so warn you, the classic Greek warning, gnothi se auton, know thyself. Uh, they used to write that above the Temple of Apollos. Know thyself. It's not kind of like an Oprah-like, you know, be in touch with yourself saying. It means recognize that you are a mortal before the Temple of Apollos. So if you're going to study and postpone all of your physics until Sunday, know thyself. You might not be able to answer all of your homework questions without help from your instructor or your TA, and therefore you might not be able to finish the homework if you just wait until Sunday to start it. So I highly recommend you start doing your homework as soon as you get the lecture. That way you can make sure you get enough help on the homework to be able to finish it. So remember, Saturday and Sunday, you, I will not be able to contact you, or you won't be able to contact me. And if you start over the weekend on your homework, you might not be able to answer all the questions. You'll have some confusion that you didn't know you had before. So don't put this off until the day it's due. This homework is intended to practice and solidify your understanding of the topics we covered the previous week. Uh, studio submissions. This will be 30% of your grade. Your studio submission will be given to Gradescope. You'll submit this as a group. This is due at the end of studio, um, really a few hours after that at 2 p.m. that day, the day you had the studio. So you have some extra time to work with your group to make sure you're sure of your answers. When you submit these to Gradescope, you need to make sure you have the names of all of your classmates tagged in your group. Gradescope allows you to do group submissions. Make sure you put all of your classmates in there. If you don't do that, it'll mess up your grades and your classmates will end up getting a zero 
even though they helped you do the studio. So please make sure to put their names. There will be four midterm exams. As stated, the total number, the mid, each midterm exam is 8%. In total, they make up 32%. And then the final exam is 23% of your total grade. Each exam is normally seven to eight problems. These are all going to be free response. And then your final exam will be cumulative covering every topic we've learned in the semester. And so here's some places to get help. Uh, there's Physics Tutorial Center, kind of. Uh, Kevin Knox and I will both be having office hours through Zoom. I will post the links to the Zoom meetings in Sakai in addition to the times. There will be a QA session as stated every single day from 9 9.50 a.m. This is just before studio during the regular lecture time. During the Q&A session, you're welcome to ask any question about any aspect of the course. You can ask a question about lecture, about studio, about the homework, about an exam, about a practice exam. Any question about the course is, per, is uh, permissible at the Q&A session. If you have questions about grading, excused absence, or ARS accommodations, I recommend please contacting me by email about those. Those might involve um, sensitive data that I can't really share in front of the class. So email me if you have any of those concerns. Lastly, like to um, state, you know, do not email me with content questions. So if you have a question about how do I use conservation of energy to calculate the final velocity, do not email me that question. Save that question for the question and answer session. The reason I don't want you to email me that question, it's not because I'm like the king of Siam and you can't contact me. It's because trying to explain how to use conservation of energy in an email is really, really hard and it's a lot of, takes a lot of time for very little payoff when if you were to ask me at the question and answer session, I could answer it in about 30 seconds. So don't, an, don't email me content questions, save those for office hours or the question and answer sessions. So things you should be doing right now, you need to go get your textbook, um, either the e-text or the hard copy if you don't already have it. Again, it's the same one we used in 114. So if you have the textbook for 114, you should already have the textbook for this course. You should go ahead and do any graded assignments on mastering physics. Uh, there is not a warm-up. We're getting rid of warm-ups, but do the, do the initial reading for modules one and two. And there are some optional assignments available on mastering physics. These, again, they're optional. But these are to help you understand one is how mastering physics works and the other is a review of math. You're going to use lots of math in physics and everyone loves math so make sure you've reviewed your math before we start. Now let's take a look at what things lie ahead for us. What, what is in the stars for us? We're going to begin talking about fluid statics and fluid dynamics. And with fluid statics we're going to be relating this to uh, concepts like blood pressure, or things like aquatic organisms. Here I have a fish with a, I think it's a fish, fish bladder disease. In fluid dynamics, we'll be talking about flight, about your circulatory system and blood, uh, blood flow in your veins. And we'll be talking about the locomotion of microorganisms like uh, sperm. Also the locomotion of macroorganisms like tuna and how that's related to um, viscosity and fluids. After this, we'll get to electrostatics. I'll be teaching these lectures. Doing, dealing with electric forces, potential, and energy. Here we will be building up to a discussion of electrocardiography. Electrocardiography, also known as an EKG, that is the machine that you see, for instance, in, in movies that, that measures your heart rate, how, how your heart is beating. We'll also have a uh, studio problem on DNA folding, which is pretty interesting. Having done electrostatics, we'll move on to electric circuits. And the buildup for electric circuits, the whole time we'll be building up to this model of the nervous system. And we're going to conclude with a how to model the human nervous system as a kind of a simple circuit is, is the goal of this whole section. Then we'll go on to magnetic fields and induction. We'll learn how this is used in animal navigation or for MRIs. Then we'll go on to optics. Optics is a, for those of you taking the MCAT, optics is a very big section on the MCAT as is fluids. So we'll be learning about um, vision, structural color. I'll be teaching this one. We'll be seeing about x-ray diffraction and electron microscopy. Uh, essentially, that is this, uh, the diffraction 
and protein structure, this is how we're able to know what the shape of DNA is. This is how we know that's a helical structure by looking at this picture. This is not a helical structure. This is a diffraction pattern from DNA. And by looking at this, uh, Rosalind Franklin was able to know what the structure of DNA was. Sadly, we will be skipping fluorescence and color vision. We're also going to be skipping microscopes, but the material for these studios will be on Sakai if you'd like to read that. Following optics, then, we're going to go into nuclear physics. I'll be teaching these two. These are the ones I get most excited for, actually. Um, the first lecture will be on radioisotopes, the kinds of radioactive decay, and seeing how those apply to nuclear medicine. We're also going to have an entire lecture on dosimetry, which is the measurement of how much radiation a patient has been exposed to, which is really important. So that's what's coming ahead. Here is what has already gone. These are some students who've taken our course and what they had to say about it. And so this student, a lot of these students were taking the MCAT and our course has a lot of subjects that are also on the MCAT. So some of these subjects like fluids are normally left out of a typical second semester physics. We make sure to cover those because those are the most important for biology majors. Those are also the most important for pre-med majors. Here's some more student feedback. Another student studying for the MCAT who found our class very helpful in preparing uh, to go on to um, medical school. And yet another person studying for the MCAT, here they found that, for instance, Reynolds number showed up on their, on their practice. And that's, Reynolds number is one of the subjects we cover that normally a, a first sem or second semester course would just completely leave out. Now we're gonna do a review of topics you should have seen in your first semester class. We begin with forces, and you should have learned forces, and forces are going to be really important when we learn fluid statics and dynamics, when we learn electrostatics, and when we learn magnetic magnetism. This is going to be the first unit, the second unit, and the fourth unit, so this is going to be very important. And so to begin, we will begin at the beginning with Newton's laws of motion. So here are Newton's laws. Um, summarize these briefly. Objects do not have an acceleration if there are no forces on them. And if objects, you know, they have a constant speed, and that speed could be zero. Newton's second law. Sorry, I accidentally clicked pause share. Newton's second law. I meant to get this annotation tool. Newton's second law is normally given as F net is equal to mass times acceleration. Notice, by the way, this is a net force. This is not some particular force. This is the sum of all the forces acting on an object will be equal to the mass of that object times that object's acceleration. The net force, just to reiterate, this is the sum of forces that act on the object. Students often like to use an equation, F equals MA, and this might sound kind of pedantic, but this is not an equation. There is no such force that is equal to a mass times an acceleration. There is, there is no such force that is like this. What is true is if you have a number of forces acting on an object, if you add all of those forces together, that net force, the sum of all of them, that net force will equal to the mass times the acceleration. If you only have one force acting on an object, for instance, you're pushing on an object, and there's only one force, or if you have, you know, only gravity is acting on the object, then that one force is the net force. Um, I, I know it might sound kind of pedantic, but please try not to use this equation. Students tend to over rely on F equals MA, and, they, and even when places where it doesn't make any sense. Then Newton's third law, uh, it's, you often hear this stated for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that's fine if that helps you remember what it is, but just if one object acts on a second object, the second object pushes back on the first object, the forces have the same magnitude but opposite directions. Let's see, let's take a look at an example where we do this. So this is your first classroom response question. Go ahead to your online form. Uh, for us, it's going to be Gradescope. Go ahead into Gradescope and find this question. This is slide number 19. And I'd like you to go ahead and answer this. Here, I have, so up here is a rope. Tied to this rope are four links of chain. These are identical links. 
These identical links are currently stationary. They're not moving. I have link one, link two, link three, and link four. I would like to know right now how many vertical forces are exerted on link three. So because this is our first question, again, I'm going to reiterate, even though I am going to give you the answer in about, oh, I don't know, 30 seconds, please try to answer this on your own. When I tell you to pause, pause it, think about it, put in your answer, and then continue. So answer this on your own. Go ahead and pause now. The correct answer is three. There are three forces acting on link three. Here they are illustrated. I have the normal force between link two and three going up. This, uh, this normal force that I'm calling it, that is the contact force between these two links because they're in contact. They can't just move through each other. And so two will be pushing up on three. And then in the other direction, I have the contact force of three with four. Notice how I'm writing this as the normal force of four on three. So the first one is what causes the force. The second letter is what is receiving the force. And I also have the weight of three pointing down. So that's three vertical forces. Here's another question. I want you to consider all of the forces that are exerted on links three and on links four. And I want you to rank them according to magnitude from the largest over here to the smallest over here. Go ahead, uh, this is slide 21. Go ahead, answer this on your own. Pause now. Let's take a look. The correct answer is D. So to see that this is D, we will begin with Newton's second law and Newton's first law. We recognize that because these are not moving, the net force has to equal zero. If the net force were not zero, they would be accelerating and then they would quickly start uh, moving. They'd quickly get a velocity. So F net equals zero. Because F net equals zero, I can consider what forces are there on link four. On link four, I have only two forces. There's the weight of four down, and then there's this contact force between four and three. So the contact force of three on four is equal to the weight of four. If it weren't, then the forces would not add up to zero. A contact force of three on four, well, by Newton's third law, that has to equal in magnitude the contact force of four on three. So this has to equal the contact force of four on three. And because all of these links are identical, the weight of four has to equal the weight of three. So all four of these forces are equal. And the only option that has all four of them equal is D. That's how I know the answer is D. If you wanted to, though, you could also consider what's going on with link two. On link two, so on link, sorry, not link two, with the normal, the contact force of two and three. If I look at link three, I have this contact force here going up, and then I have two forces down. I have the contact force between four and three, and then I have the weight of three. Let me clearly label these. This is the contact force of four acting on three, and here's the weight of E on three. The reason I clearly label these, you'll notice that the weight of four is not acting on link three. This often confuses students. Even though three is supporting the weight of four, Force three does not experience the weight of four. Only four can experience the weight of four. Three, insofar as it's experiencing the weight of four, it's only doing it through the contact force. So touching three, the Earth's gravity is not pulling down on three with the force of four. What actually happens is this contact force between three and four is what is pulling down on three, and it's pulling down on it with the same strength equal to the weight of four. That I know that sounds, again, pedantic, but be clear about your language. The weight of four does not actually act on link three. Let's do a brief review of work and energy principles. I'll begin with the definition of work. Work is a scalar quantity, and it's defined in terms of two vectors. 
the force and a displacement. And over small, small displacements or in constant forces, um, we can represent the work done as the force dotted with the displacement. And so this is a product called the dot product. The dot product is a way of taking two vectors and creating a scalar out of those. If you don't know what the dot product is, then that's OK. To calculate work, you could just take the magnitude of the force. Notice there's not a vector on this one because it's the magnitude, times the magnitude of the displacement. Again, there's no vector because it's a magnitude now, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. So in this picture here, if this is displacement, that is your force. The cosine of the angle between them is given here in this picture. After work, we define kinetic energy. This is the energy associated with motion. You can calculate it as 1 half mv squared. And from work and kinetic energy, we can now define our work kinetic energy theorem, which states that the net work is equal to the sum in kinetic energy. Your net work, that is not your internet connection, your net work, that is equal to the sum of work done by all of the forces in your acting on your system. You could also write this as the sum of all the forces dotted with the displacement. So net work is equal to the net force. Sorry, I'm drawing this with my mouse and it's not as good. Is the net work is the net force dotted in with the displacement? We just defined kinetic energy, now let's define potential energy. Potential energy, this is caused by a conservative force. Uh, conservative forces, those are forces that conserve energy. And the exact form of the potential energy will depend on the nature of the force. For gravity close to the Earth, the gravitational potential energy has a form like this, whereas for a spring, the spring potential energy will have a form like this. The potential energy will depend not just on the nature of the force, but it will also depend on the position. So for instance, you notice that gravity depends on height, whereas spring potential energy depends on the displacement, how stretched out the spring is. This one you'll see is a linear potential. This one over here, this is a squared, it's a parabolic potential. With potential energy and kinetic energy, we can now define the total mechanical energy which is the kinetic plus the potential. Let me clear all my drawings. Let's define the important concept of a system. So a system is defined as a collection of objects and the interactions that exist between the objects. As an example, you could define your system to be just a ball, and then any force acting on the ball is an external ball, it's outside of the system. You could define your system to be a ball and a string that's tied to it. And then the string force acting on the ball will be an internal force as part of your system. You could define your system to be an elevator and the earth. And then the interaction of gravity between them is also part of your system. So the forces that exist between objects in a system are called internal forces. And there can only be potential energy if there are internal forces. So the internal forces are what create the potential energy. The work done by the internal forces will end up storing or releasing potential energy. And this tells you that the internal work, the work done by the internal forces, is equal to the negative change in potential energy. What this means is that when internal work uh, for instance, if you were to stretch out a spring and you have the two ends of your spring here, the force of the, on the two ends of these springs is directed inward. So my internal force is going to want to pull my spring together. As it pulls the spring together, it does positive work. Doing that positive work, though, I am losing my potential energy, which is to say that the internal forces do work by losing potential energy. They do positive work by losing potential energy. Work done by external forces, this is what changes the mechanical energy. You could see this by writing out the net work as the internal work plus the external work. And you rearrange this for internal work. You write it delta U and move it over. Network equals delta K. 
And so you can rearrange it as the external work equals the change in potential plus the change in U. And that's the same thing as the change in E of the total mechanical energy. This is another way of writing it. This is the same expression as this one, just written differently, maybe in a more useful form for uh, conservation of energy questions. This says the kinetic plus potential initial and then plus whatever external work is going to go into your system, that is equal to the final kinetic plus potential. And if there is no external work, if, if there's no external forces acting on your system, then energy is conserved. And the kinetic plus potential initial equals kinetic plus potential final. So here are some illustrations of forces and displacements. In each of these cases, one through five, I have an identical particle. It moves an identical displacement, but with different forces. Uh, this, this force F is acting in different ways as it is displaced. I would like you to rank these cases in terms of the work done from most negative on the left to most positive over here on the right. So go ahead and do this on your own. Answer now. Correct answer is D, four, two, five, three, and one. Take a look at this. Case four, the two forces are exactly opposite each other. Exactly opposite. The cosine is going to be negative one. Negative one is the most negative that cosine can be. So this will be the most negative answer. Contrarywise, case one up here, the two are completely in line. The angle is zero. Cosine of zero is one. One is the most positive value that cosine can have. So case one has to be the most positive. Over here at case four, that has to be the most negative. Uh, then case two, case two, they are almost completely 180, but they're not quite. They're a little bit off from 180. That means the cosine will not quite be negative one. It'll be slightly more positive. And therefore case two is more positive than case four. Case five, they're at 90 degrees. When the work and the force are at 90 degrees, sorry, when the displacement and the force are at 90 degrees, there is no work done. So case five has zero work. And then case three is going to be between case five and case one. Here's our last question. This is on slide 27. You have a ball attached to a string and it's swinging from a peg. It's gonna go from point A to B to C T1, T2, and T3. I'm going to define two systems. System one is just the ball, and system two is the ball and the earth. So I'd like you to answer this question. Uh, for which of the following, which of the following quantities, here are several quantities, which of these is the same in both of these systems? Go ahead and answer now. The correct answer is delta K. In system one, the earth is an external force. Because the earth is an external force, that means that it, it can't, there, there are no other internal forces in system one. So there is no delta U in system one. Also because the earth is an external force in system one, it will be doing external work. External work will cause delta E to change. System two, there are no external forces because now the gravity is included in the system. So in system one, there is an external work. In system two, there is not an external work. So the only thing that could be the same is delta K. Here's another question. This is on slide 29. The gravitational force of the Earth on the ball is a force external to which of these two systems? And I kind of already gave you the answer, but go ahead and answer now. The correct answer is system one. And so we have to be really careful about what, what it means we mean when we say internal. And when I defined my system to include the ball and the earth, I have to be including the force between the ball and the earth, which is gravity. Now we're going to fill out this table here. This table um, will give us, we're going to indicate on this table whether I have plus a positive, a negative, or a zero for each of these quantities. You will see a similar table like this in your studio. So let's go through this. All right. System one, I'm going to start with kinetic energy. I know that the kinetic energy going from point B to point C, well, this is going to be rising and the gravitational force will be downward. So the displacement 
and the gravitational potential energy are opposite. That means my net work will be negative and my change in kinetic energy is equal to my net work and therefore my delta K has to be negative. Likewise, for system two, the net work is going to be the same. It'll be due to gravity and therefore delta K will also be negative. Looking at external work, in system one, all of that gravitational work, that was external work. And so there's negative external work done on system one. However, in system two, all of that network was internal. So there is no external work done in system two. The change in mechanical energy for system one, because there was external work done, the, the internal energy will change and I'll have a negative change in mechanical energy. However, for system two, there was no external work. So there was no change in the mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is conserved in system two. Since mechanical energy is conserved in system two, here's the, the big one. There is no change in the total mechanical energy. The kinetic energy decreased and therefore the potential energy had to have increased in system two. Whereas in system one, there is no internal force, so there cannot be a potential energy and there is no change in the potential energy. It is, there isn't any, there isn't one. All right, that's how you would fill in a table like this. Uh, that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you guys very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you all in studio.